and only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Christina Fugis, Editorial Director with Moldmaking Technology Magazine. Welcome to our webinar sponsored by Symmetron. Our topic this afternoon is molding parts to specs on first shot. Many plastic parts are challenging to mold with intolerance on the first, second, and sometimes third shot. Many factors affect the shrink and warp of the part. Because of the traditionally high cost of simulation, many shops still opt for machining the cavity to a steel safe condition molding the part, and then reworking the mold according to the deformation. In this webinar, you will learn how some shops have found a cost-effective means of simulation and easy modification of the mold geometry. You'll learn how shops can utilize cost-effective CAE tools, use advanced warping tools to modify geometry with a deformation compensation percentage, use efficient tool pathing with multiple surface offset groups to minimize CAD work, provide shorter lead times to their customers, and advertise this capability as a value-added service. Our presenter this afternoon is John Barnes. John has been in the mold-making industry for 20 years and has worked in each department of a mold shop. At Symmetron, he has held technical support, applications engineering, and sales positions. His well-rounded experience helps him provide mold makers with insight for continuous improvement in all facets of the mold-making process. As you listen to John's presentation, please feel free to ask questions by typing them in the questions pane on your computer. John will answer them at the end of the presentation. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to listen to it later online. Thanks again for being or taking some time today to be with us, and here's John. Thanks, Christina. <clears throat> uh, first, a little about Summitron. Uh, we're a leader in CAD CAM solutions for mold, tool, and die makers. Uh, we just recently celebrated our 30th anniversary. Uh, we're in operations in 35 countries, 40,000 installations, and Symmetron customers have been shown to deliver tools faster than the industry best in class. And a little about Moldex. <laughs> Uh, Cortex System is the world's largest plastic injection holding CAE independent software vendor. 80% experienced engineering professionals comprise it with nine global offices, 100 international resellers, and they have strategic alliances with uh, many CAD companies. Historically, Injection simulation software has been very expensive, difficult to learn and use. It took a CAE engineer to use this type of software due to the complexity of it. Much work was required to prepare the mesh before the simulation could be done. That could take a whole day all by itself. Then calculating the simulation on a single core CPU would take another day or more. And even at the high cost of the software and tedious hours required to prepare the project, shrink and warp prediction was not incredibly accurate. How the part would warp was quite good, but the actual amount was not. Most mold builders today wouldn't consider, or in the past rather, wouldn't consider running an injection analysis unless their customer requested and paid for it. Still somewhat true today. Well, whose job is it? Is it the product designer's responsibility or the mold builder's responsibility to know when a simulation is useful? Some product manufacturers request CAE to ensure the mold can be filled and the gates are suitable. However, that is only one aspect. For example, how can you be sure that the mold designer is adequately cooling the mold and reducing hot spots that will affect the warp and cycle time of the part? Moldex 3D has simplified the CAE process with this e-design product. Meshing is done automatically and in 3D. Setting up the project is so easy that even a CAD designer can learn to do it usually in a single day. Parallel computing allows simulation time to be measured in hours instead of days, and the cost has really come down. Paper use is now available for shops that may not require that many simulations per year, 
and the pay-per-use hours uh, starts out at just 200 hours at a price that you would probably expect to pay for one or two simulations done outside. Some shops are finding out how cost-effective and easy it is to utilize CAE tools to better design the mold for their customers and save time and money during their build. We will look at some examples of what I mean about this. Let's take a closer look at the software. Okay, the first thing that we're going to look at is the eDesign product where we're setting up the project. Um, it's really quite simple. All we do is, in, is import a part. Uh, we can either import curves that represent uh, the runner and gates, or you can draw them in eDesign. Then you can import the water circuit. Uh, again, you can draw in here as well. Then you set a meshing level, and there's a slide bar here that goes from uh, fast to accurate. And what that really does is it uh, creates different size cubes of the SDL. I can show that in a second. And then lastly, you uh, save this, and we're going to open up the secondary software in a second. Uh, let me just show you one thing here, what I meant about the cubes. We'll cut away a little section here and zoom in and take a look at it. And turn on the edges. So this is the little 3D cubes that we talk about when we say that Moldex 3D is based on uh, 3D data. It really is 3D. So let's go ahead and close this one out. And then this is the one where we set up the material selection, the process settings, uh, everything that will be relevant uh, to running the simulation. And let me hit play and we'll look at this animation. Okay, and I just want to go through and hit on a couple of things. We won't spend a lot of time in this one. Uh, but I want to show in packing, there's some nice tools here that can predict uh, sink marks. Uh, this part has a pretty uniform wall thickness, uh, so I don't think we're going to find too many, but uh, it's, I want to point it out because I believe it's important. Here's a sink mark indicator. And it's going to show us a scale in color over here. And it even gives us an amount. So we can see that in the red areas, we can expect to get about four thousandths of shrink. I'm sorry, sink. Now, it's nice to be able to not just see it, but to have an idea of the amount. Because maybe you know a few thousandths is OK. But if it was a millimeter, it probably wouldn't be OK. So the point that I want to make during this presentation is that we're not just seeing the uh, tendency of the deformation, we can actually see the values as well. And I think that's important. Next, let's look at cooling. Uh, here, this cooling, let's start here. Start with the cooling time. Let's hit play here. So this is the cooling time of the part. And again, it's showing us in real seconds how long it's going to take this part to cool and the last area to cool. And of course, that will have an impact on the shrink and the work of the part. Uh, the cooling efficiency is what I was mentioning earlier that might be valuable to the mold maker. 
this particular water layout that I have has got some lines running on the inside of the part and some on the outside. And what this is showing is the amount, the percentage that each circuit is contributing to cooling of the part. And you can see that the lines inside are taking 20% of the part, while the blue, dark blue lines out here are drawing less than 3%. So the mold maker might decide that uh, it's not worth even spending the time to drill those lines because you're only taking 3% of the cooling out. Maybe it'd be better to put another circuit inside and forget about these guys. So this is really the benefit of running this type of simulation to optimize the cooling circuit and save time during the mold build. <clears throat> Next we're going to look at the warpage. Okay. First of all, uh, we can look at this in different axes. So right now we're looking at just the X displacement uh, during the shrinkage and warpage. And we can see that just the end of this part is moving. But again, we get a value. So we can see that at the worst, it's going to be about 40 thousandths in X. And if we look at Y, we see that this area right here is uh, collapsing the most. And if we look at Z, uh, these corners tend to be moving the most. But now let's go to total displacement. And this is uh, all three axes considered. And we can see that, again, this red area is the worst. And it's moving about 110 thousandths, uh, which is pretty considerable. Uh, so of course, we could go back and we could change the cooling circuit and say, well, what if we put some bobblers in here? Uh, is that going to make it better? And we can rerun the simulation and test different cooling circuits to see if we can minimize that warpage. And of course, that's the, the right approach to take. Uh, but for today's demonstration, we're going to assume that we spent time doing that. And we've considered that that's the best we can do. And now we want to kind of implement this uh, windage into the mold. Now let me just run this too. This one's kind of neat. This one, well, you can set a scale factor and you can exaggerate the warpage. And you can even record a little movie of it. It just does a little animation of the direction so that you can see what's going on. And again, it's a, it's a scale factor. It's not quite that bad. It's an exaggeration. And on the same window, uh, we stop this <clears throat> and we go over here. This button will allow us to output the warpage as an STL. And this is where the real value comes in. Okay. First of all, we can set this scale uh, to be one to one and we would get an output STL of the warped file or we can give it a percentage. And um, you know, sometimes you might opt not to move it 100% compensated, but maybe you would compensate 75 or 80%. Whatever factor you want to put in here, you can put it in. And you check this box, and you can get a reverse deformation direction. So you can output the warp file and then the warp compensated file. And then we can use the CAD software to match it up. Okay, and that's where we're going to begin in Symmetron. We're going to look at uh, an overlay now of the, the worked part, which is here in red, and the, the regular part model, which is there in purple. Let's zoom in and take a look. You can see that we're on the inside here as the part's collapsing. And let's turn off that model and turn on the compensated model. So here's the opposite result that we're trying to get to. 
So we want to manipulate the purple part to match the green STL file that's been uh, compensated. Now, if many of you have worked with uh, STL files in the past, you know that uh, most CAD systems don't really like them. Uh, some CAD systems can't even uh, draw lines on them or you really do much of anything with them, not even move them in some cases. Uh, Symmetron is pretty flexible with them. We can draw lines, we can move it, rotate, that kind of thing. And what I've actually done is I've drawn lines from the end point of the purple to the end point of the green at each location. And I'm saying that this is what I want to move to. And let's activate that part file. <clears throat> and we're going to use the advanced warping tool. And for any Symmetron customers that are watching this, uh, this tool is available under Solid uh, Warp Advanced Warping. Okay, so here we're going to go to Advanced Warping. We're going to edit the feature. We can see that we've got our target and destination. Let me spread this apart so you can see it. Yeah, so we got our source and our target, and we did it a few times here. And we also have some extra settings down here that can help us. Here, I'm defining some offset constraints, and I'm tagging points on this wall and calling that zero, which means that I want the deformation to be from this line up, and I don't want to disturb the part from this line down. And uh, that's very important. If we just manipulate this model and let it tug and pull on all the surfaces, we could wind up being uh, you know, out of spec in other critical areas. So it's important that we have this type of control to make it happen. All right, so now let me unsuppress this. And now if we zoom in, you can see that the purple model has been moved over to match the STL. And it's uh, pretty good to be comfortable with that. So again, um, let me go back to my PowerPoint for a second. You know, once we have the warp prediction, uh, it's important that you have a strong modeling package to implement the windage into the mold. And some jobs will certainly be easier than others to implement the change. Symmetron does have dedicated tools to help automate the process whenever possible. However, I do not wish to mislead anyone. A complex part will require manual work and strong surfacing. And since we are focusing on efficiency, I would like to show just a few of the dedicated mold design tools that Symmetron has to offer. And I always try to stress the importance of using an integrated software for both design and manufacturing. Data translations cost time and sever associativity and impede communication between departments. And then lastly today, uh, we will look at how we can utilize efficient NC to minimize some of the CAD work as well. Uh, next, though, I want to go back into Symmetron, and I want to show another example. Okay, here's a part, again, where... Um, Let's say that we were molding this and we found out that this inside edge was collapsing and we knew what the amount was. Uh, I didn't run a simulation on this one because I wanted to show something different. What I actually did is I went in to the sketcher and I just drew an arc from end to end. And I have a uh, reference line here. And what I'm going to do, well, before I show you that, let me show you this. 
I've taken this part and I've divided it along a plane. So I've kind of uh, divided this area away from the original model so that I'm only working with this piece. And then what I did is I set a, a warping direction and I said that I wanted to move from this edge here over to that edge. Let's unsuppress this one. So it doesn't matter whether you're working with an STL or just geometry. Uh, you can still make it. Um, you can use whatever reference you, that you want to use. So here's the change in the part, moving all those features over. I think, let me just check. Yeah, so here I think I kept original, uh, but I could have removed the original too. Okay, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes uh, showing some of the dedicated mold design tools that Symmetron has to offer. Uh, the first thing that I want to show is uh, adding some baffles to this part. Sometimes adding baffles and ejector pins can be a pretty tedious task. So I'm going to come down here to the cooling design and say uh, add cooling item with channel. I'm going to pick a baffle. And we're going to place it on this face. And then I'm going to use Add Geometry for the sketch that I have. And when I place them by a sketch, all these drop in on the points. But I can still break them and move them around individually. And I can set a grid. Um, but what I really want to show is that these depths are different. As soon as I place those baffles, they go hunting for the uh, next place that the clearance area would touch. And the reason these aren't all the way to the tip is because they're touching on the diameter. So it's looking this way and also this way at a given distance that we're defining. And I can hit uh, automatic analysis and then analyze. Oops. I dropped another baffle, sorry, let me close them out. All right, and then uh, we can also turn these independently. So if I want to turn all of them by 90 degrees, I can. Because I do want these guys running that way. But these ones over here I want to turn independently. So I can set it to individual control. And we can just move these two uh, back to zero. And all the uh, holes will be put in automatically at the proper lengths. Okay, next. 
Uh, we have a table of baffles. If I wanted to output a chart with all the different lengths, uh, we could do that for the guy who's going to go have to cut them all. Uh, this mark cooling circuit is a nice feature. I can just box pick everything here and, and tell it to analyze the cooling circuit. And it will color everything according to the uh, intelligent features, such as these um, plugs. It'll know that that's a stop tool. If I have a diverter, it'll know about that. Let me try that again. My colors didn't take. All right, sorry, I'm not getting that to work. But anyhow, it just puts these lines as being red and says that these are uh, not going through. And then I get uh, a circuit that will be like blue. And when you have a real complex water design, sometimes it helps to be able to color code the circuits in order to be able to see it, especially out on the shop floor. All right, let's add a couple of ejector pins, and then we'll look at some NC. Let's take a key pin at a 3 8 diameter. <clears throat> and we don't care about the length. The software will figure out what length we need and put the appropriate length in at each location. And here we can use the grid again. We can set it to be whatever we want. Work with 100 dial increments. And we'll just drop a few here. Okay. And place those without cut. Then we can go back here and we do ejector trim. And we'll pick a couple of these guys and trim them by the movable side. Uh, maybe do like a 15 thousandths offset up into the part. And then we want to do ejector pocket. That's going to put the clearance through the plates and into the retainer plate along with the keyed. I'm asking for one inch of fit around the pin at the top and then a 1 32nd clearance below. Okay, and here we're going to hide this bottom plate and look at it and we see that the keys are there. And of course we get the clearance in the B plate and the land around the pin. So that's some of the nice dedicated tools that we have to make that go quicker. And now we want to look at NC and see how NC can help us in order to minimize CAD work as well. Uh, let's start by looking at the A side. Okay, so earlier I was mentioning uh, about using color. One thing that I've noticed when I travel the country uh, talking to customers and prospects is that sometimes the CAD designers spend a lot of time doing all the offsetting of surfaces for the relief areas. And personally, I think it's a much more efficient way to handle it when you can uh, just make it a color. You can see that I don't have any shifts here. I've simply put a break on these and colored them differently. And then when I'm doing my machining, uh, let's look at this one. This is my semi-finishing hat. <clears throat> Let me go to a wireframe so you can see it. 
and I'm telling it that when it sees a purple surface to violate by 10 or 15 thousandths and when you see a blue surface you know cut it to zero and then over here what I was thinking is that this is the area that we kind of compensated and maybe we want to leave that a little bit steel safe just to be on the safe side so we could say stay away by 10 thousandths over here so in one tool path we could be violating by 10 in the purple area cutting to zero in the blue area and staying away by 10 in the orange area but if we're going to do that it ought not be a 3D offset uh, let me show you why yeah this one if I want to run the cutter across this area and I'm telling it to stay away by 10 over here on the orange area let me position the tool here so you can see it as that tool runs across when it gets to this point here it's going to be lifting up 10 thousandths and I don't really want that I want it to run across there so even though we're doing three different surface offset groups we can still break up the walls and floors so I'm saying to give me one thousandths on the floors and the wall on the orange stuff it's probably easier if I show it and try to explain it yeah so here for our orange surfaces we're staying away by actually 20 on the walls and only one thou on the floors and when I say floor that's what it considers in a vertical area so it's not staying away by 20 in the Z it's only staying away by 20 in the X and Y and only one thou in Z so I'm not getting that big lift here on the end and then if we look at it you can see that the tool comes across it's minus 10 and then it hits this and it comes up to zero it comes over here and when it hits that wall it lifts up just one thou just to be a little bit extra safe and we're just running across this whole top now even here I'm also staying away on the, on the walls I'm really not hitting this wall and climbing up let me show you here at this point I'm also safe I think it's like uh, 10 thousands or something, but I'm not bumping that wall. I'm staying awake, because so I'm going to come back and finish these guys. I'm just getting close. So it's got a lot of control over uh, uh, walls and floors and multiple surface offset groups in order to make this easier. But I don't want to take the time to put all my clearance in, you know, offsetting surfaces and trying to make it all perfect. I'd rather just uh, put a seam on it make it a different color and let the tool pass handle it because I believe that's more efficient. The other thing that we can do is we can define sharp edges. Here I'm saying that, that this uh, purple line is my parting, parting edge. I need that to be crisp so I don't let the tool roll over it. So I'm not giving this a Z limit. I'm just saying avoid that edge and the tool will position itself to the tangent of the ball up against that edge and not have any waterfall motions down it in order to keep the edges nice and crisp. Okay, and then also here we've got some what I call local machining areas. Um, let's see what this one is doing. Yeah, this one is called morph between two curves. So I'm saying that I want to start at this top curve and morph down to this bottom curve and give me a helix the whole way down. And if we navigate this, we can kind of see what it's doing. I'm doing an elongated stretch on this side so that I'm not rounding off this crisp edge. See how I'm going up past, doing a little loop and coming back, so keeping that corner nice and sharp. We've got something kind of similar here. Uh, if I wanted to make a local area running around this shot off band, uh, we could do the same type of thing where I'm saying start on this edge, come to this edge, and follow the shape. So we get that nice, nice finish around that shut off band. 
Uh, the last thing I want to show on this one is that, uh, um, yeah, with this one right here, we are using uh, two different length of tools. Let me go to the navigator and position the tool here. So we're starting out with an average length uh, half inch ball tool. And we hope that we can cut most everywhere with that. But there will be some spots where that tool wasn't long enough. And it'll leave those areas and it'll go back and grab a longer tool and just finish up the areas that the shorter tool couldn't go. Because we wouldn't want to try finishing this old job with a cutter hanging out that far. Uh, we'd get vibration. We'd have to run it slower. We'd have to take a lesser down step. Uh, we want to try to stay as efficient as possible during the machining. So we let the software use the short tool wherever it can, and then go grab the long tool and finish up. And we do that uh, in all of our procedures, uh, you know, especially remachining. All right, so let me close this one out. And we'll open up the core. And this is another kind of similar path that I wanted to show because it's kind of neat. Um, I want to point out, too, uh, for better or for worse, that this floor is not flat. Uh, when we when we did that that uh, advanced warping and we tugged on that to bring it over, uh, it made made this floor, you know, the Z level changes. It's not a lot, but it's enough where we can't just run a flat tool in there and call it good. So it makes it challenging to cut. Uh, you got to be able to have good tool control to be able to come in here and cut this efficiently now, and. What I've created here is a cutter path that's a lot like a 2D cutter path, uh, but it's not 2D. And I want to kind of explain what I did. What I'm telling it is that I want to machine this green surface and check against these yellow surfaces. So I'm going to be coming along the green, trying to cut that, but lifting the tool up to not violate the yellow. And if you think about it, say we finished this with a half-inch ball and we had a quarter-inch radius in there, we can take pretty good stepovers on the outside. But once we start to get into that fillet, we want to take smaller stepovers. And that's exactly what we can do with this type of procedure. Uh, we can go in here and in the roughing, we can say, I want multiple passes. I want 10 roughing passes at 50 thousandths. And I want three or four or five finishing passes at only 10 thousandths. So those last you know, five passes end up not being quite as heavy of a cut. So let's look at the result. Position it over here. You know, again, we're riding along this edge and checking against these guys because that floor is not flat if I put my info bar on here. Watch my Z. So it's kind of like a 2D path, but we're cutting three-dimensional. Uh, and then if any of you guys are fortunate enough to have five axis machines, I wanted to show what we can do with uh, what we call auto tilt. And here I've got a uh, remachining that I'm doing with a quarter inch ball. You go to the navigator, position the tool here so you can see it's not a very long ball cutter, a uh, pretty standard length quarter inch tool. And I want to try to re machine all of this. Well, this is our standard uh, remachining. Let me turn the speed up. And it wants to stay normal to Z as much as it can. But when it has to tip, it'll do it automatically. And you don't have to uh, really do anything except hit a checkbox. So this takes, this makes five axis work super easy. Uh, it's no different than three axis machining and then checking the box. And that's the way to go for picking. It's pretty awesome.
again here, when it doesn't have to tip, it's not going to tip because uh, if you haven't seen a five-axis machine move, uh, you should know that it's not always the most efficient means of movements, and sometimes the tool will hesitate as the table's turning or something. So the more often you can stay in three-axis machining, the uh, better off you are. But when you need five-axis, uh, it's pretty nice to have. All right, I don't think I really have too much more to show. Uh, we are going to have questions. Uh, let me go back to the presentation. Okay. I see a question here. What is the difference between mold flow and mold X 3D? Um, is Ken Ken Chang on the line with us? Why don't you introduce Ken, John? Yeah, Ken Chang is uh, uh, he works for Mold X 3D. He's a part of product development or uh, business development, and he's been a good friend of mine. Uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, Ken, if you could help me answer that question, I'd appreciate it. Is your mic on, Ken? <laughs> All right, I might have to answer it myself. I'll do the best <laughs> I can. <laughs> well, we can start uh, with a different question if you want Ken to answer that one. Um, well, yeah, let's give it a minute and see if he comes, comes on to help. Uh, oh, I see there's a scroll bar here, okay. I thought we only had one question. I guess we have a few more. No, we have a quite a few questions. Uh, to okay. take, if, if you see any of those you want to prioritize, or see any yeah, okay. you have Here's a good one. Here's an easy one I can answer. Are you able to simulate insert mold or over molding? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it does support multiple component molding, two shot. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you able to optimize your cooling channel? Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, that's another thing I didn't mention was that it does support like valve gates. Uh, you can set different temperatures on the A side and B side. Uh, if you wanted to have you know different water temperature in the cavity than in the core, you can uh, set all that stuff up and run it. We do have quite. Go ahead. Uh, no, you go ahead. Sorry. I say we do have quite a few questions from. Um, I don't know if you can see that pane, and I could go right down them. Um, I know you covered a lot of ground, starting with Moldex and going into Symmetron E. But it looks like one of the mm -hmm. earlier questions was, can Moldex do warpage analysis of our specific parts um, that were measured at first shot, so we can compare the Moldex prediction to actual parts? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Read that one more time. I kind of got lost. Can Moldex do warpage analysis of our specific parts that were measured at first shots so we can compare the Moldex prediction to actual parts? Ah, yeah, so they want to do like a benchmark. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we can do a, do a benchmark and prove the results are accurate. I mean, w w one of the things that I found, and I, was, I hesitated to explain it earlier, but if you guys can picture just like a, a rectangle canister, right, a rectangle canister where maybe the, the long ends kind of collapsed in. Well, maybe that collapse really was 100 thousandths, but if you compensate it and you put it out to 100 thousandths, and now you've got a bow in it, any engineer would know that a bow is like a bridge, right? So you add strength to that direction. So even though you move it 100 thousandths, now you've changed the shape of the part, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna, it's going to come back 100 thousandths. That's why a lot of guys opt to try 75 or 80 percent because once you alter the part and rerun it, you're with the new part now and uh, you know, you, I guess you could simulate that one again just to ch double check it, but that's a little nuances I think that some people miss. 
Uh, do the plastic materials need to be accurately characterized in Moldex as they are in mold flow? Yes. Uh, yeah, material is very important. I believe that uh, Moldex 3D has a database of like, I don't know, five or six or seven thousand materials. It's quite extensive. But occasionally we do run across materials that aren't in the database. And what we do is we submit that to Moldex 3D. Uh, they send it to their developers. They look at it. Oftentimes they'll come back with a uh, substitution and they'll say, go ahead and use this other material. The characteristics uh, are the same. Hmm. Uh, also, we do allow the users to create their own materials. If they can get the data sheet uh, from their supplier, they can plug in all the right parameters and create their own material. Let's see. And, you know, I mentioned paper use. Um, uh, there's different increments of paper use. You can rent 200 calculation hours, or 500 calculation hours, or 10,000 calculation hours. And you know, we don't usually try to quote pricing in these types of webinars, uh, just in case this webinar stays live for five years. We don't want to be locked into a price, but I can tell you that it's uh, a lot more reasonable than you probably would expect. And if you have any interest in you know, getting pricing, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised at the cost of it. Another question is, what tools are there in the CAE for hot runner systems and valve gates? Uh, yeah, um, I believe it was, gosh, I don't want to make a mistake here, but I want to say that PESCO just recently started using Mold X3D exclusively. Uh, so it definitely is uh, very, a very good product for uh, hot runner systems, uh, supports all of that, supports valve gates. Uh, I don't believe there's any functionality that the software is missing uh, for any of that stuff. How? Right. Questions keep coming in. Can you see that questions pane? Did you expand that to see all the ones? No, I don't think I did. If you look over there, you can, you can, because you probably don't have it expanded. Yeah, I don't think I do. Uh, okay, one second. Where it says questions, the minus sign, we might have a plus sign to open it up. Okay. And then the top right, there's an actual button that will expand it. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I was able to undock it. Now I can see. There you go. And you see, can you see, you can scroll down. There's a whole okay. list of questions there. Okay, yeah, good, good. Some referring to earlier on in the whole presentation. Okay, yeah, here's a good one. Does Moldex total displacement and individual displacement include the shrinkage amount of the plastic? Uh, I believe that answer is yes, that when it looks at the, the warp, it just taking into account uh, the warp of the part and the shrink of the part at the same time. Uh, here's one, has correlation of the amount of warpage prediction been verified in actual parts? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely. Uh, we've done quite a few benchmarks where uh, the guys just couldn't believe how accurate it was. I mean, I'm not talking about tenths, but I'm talking about within thousands. It's uh, incredibly accurate. Now, I must uh, qualify that by saying that the process settings are going to have a big impact. So if you just run the software with generic settings and then you go out to the machine and you change the process settings, then of course it's not going to be the same. Uh, but if you use the right process settings, uh, the software is incredibly accurate. Does the geometry of the part affect the accuracy of the warpage results? Uh, I would say yes. <clears throat> Does it support LSR materials? The simulation software? Uh, I don't know what LSR means. It's the liquid silicone? Ah, uh, yeah, I believe it does, but I think that might be a different module. Uh, we'd have to get verification on that, but I, I, I believe that uh, it can support it. And how is it about generating reports for, for the customer? Can we generate reports? Oh, yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, there is a template to, to generate reports. 
that you can send to your customer. There's also uh, a free viewer that your customer can download. Uh, and you could actually take the project and open it and you know spin it around and look at it. Uh, so it supports either either way. Is there a free viewer to share the project with customers? Yep. Uh, I just read one here. Uh, hold on. Somebody had asked if we can do sequential. Uh, can we do sequential mold filling? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, for sure we can. Does the program suggest locations for venting to allow for burn prevention? Uh, yes, yeah, it has shows uh, air traps and um, you know, and it can do you know gate suggestion. But the problem with any gate suggestion is that you know usually where it suggests you to put the gate, you can't put it there anyway. So hmm. uh, you know, there's still some hu human intervention required there. I see one up at the top. Does Moldex 3D help in setting up the mold press settings? Uh, yeah, it can give you good generic starting points. Uh, so yeah, it can. It can certainly get you in the ballpark quicker. Uh, but you know, then again, you know, as you change it at the machine, you may sneak away from the accuracy of the simulation. So under ideal situations, it's best to put the right process settings into the simulation, but of course you can run the simulation more than once. You run it at the generic, you look at it, you see what you like or don't like, and you can tweak it and run it again. So this is the, the value of uh, the software is being able to run multiple iterations uh, with different parameters to kind of fine tune uh, the results. Uh, somebody had asked if, if it uh, has algorithms for aluminum as the mold material. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean certainly you have to pick the, the material. Uh, whether the mold is made out of steel or aluminum will have a huge impact uh, on the part. So we have to set up the mold material. And if you have like um, uh, inserts in the mold, you can set that up as well, like mold max type stuff. Hello. Hey, Ken. Hey, John. You, Sorry, um, Ken. I was not able to connect to the. I don't know what's happening. Okay, that no is problem. We, we only left one question for you, Ken. I was afraid to tackle it. <laughs> Somebody had asked, "What's the difference between Moldex 3D and Moldflow?" And I would have felt better if you answered that question. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, the Moldex 3D we use everything as a 3D mesh, including the runner cavity cooling channel. And we generate solid mesh with only one click. So basically, if you have your catch geometry, then you could generate solid mesh easily. And why do I emphasize 3D mesh is very important is when the material go through runner, it will cause friction. And friction will cause heat, and heat will cause the temperature different. So when temperature hotter, the viscosity will be lower. So which means your material will be easier to flow. And you know warpage is a combination from flow, pack, cool. So if you are not able to predict your flow pattern correctly, then your warpage won't be correct, especially when the material including fiber. OK. Uh, Any other one. question? Yeah, uh, when we use glass-filled polymers, does the CAE support those simulations? Uh, yes, uh, we have a 6,000 6, material inside our data bank. And also, if you are not able to find the material you are using, then you could provide us the raw data to us, and we are able to fit those raw data into our material format. And then you are able to run the simulation, and it is free. Hey Ken, somebody wants to know approximately how long it took to run that that model uh, of that cover. Do you have a uh, estimate? Yeah, on the time? Uh, it's 
yeah, for us to generate from study mesh until run the simulation, then to get a full analysis like cooling, packing, uh, cooling flow, cooling, filling, packing, cooling, orbit. The total hours is I use a six cores, and total hours is like two hours. Wow, that's great. Yeah. There's another software too, SigmaSoft. Someone's asking if you could speak to the main difference with that software. Uh, yes, uh, SigmaSoft is a technology is, which is very similar to our product we call eDesign. However, uh, Modability, we are not only able to do conventional injection molding, we could do injection compression molding, compression molding and pure uh, mucil process. Also, we are able to predict, uh, we are able to bring a fiber orientation then to the structure software. So, our capability is much more than the mm -hmm. other competitors. Also, we are able to simulate material flow into the mold and your insert deflection. We are able to simulate insert deflection. Hey, Ken, here's a good one. Is the software capable of doing a runner balance for multiple cavity tools? Uh, yes. If your mold is of multiple cavities or family, family mold, we are able to help you to find a flow unbalance. Then you are able to modify your get location or modify your runner size then to get a flow balance. Otherwise, if your flow is unbalanced, sometimes the one part you pack more than the other one, then you will cause the orbit. The quality is not dif the quality. The orbit quality will be different. Uh, here's what I want to take: Is Moldex able to import runners and even gates from any standard CAD software? And the answer is uh, absolutely right. Yeah. I mean that yeah. it's almost ideal. I mean, I, I'm a CAD designer. I like Symmetron. I don't want to be drawing gates and runners and water circuits inside eDesign. I want to draw what I draw in, and I can pass that information to eDesign much easier than trying to use that one. And eDesign uh, is integrated with, um, gosh, I hate to say this during <laughs> the webinar, but it's integrated in what, ProE, uh, what else, Can SolidWorks? Yeah, and that, most most of mainstream CAD software, you are able to use it with the mode 3D. So basically, you could import IJS step file, STL, or Parasolid into mode 3D. Also, we have a product integrated with a, like a, such as a Simatron, SolidWorks, uh, NX, and the PDC, Creole, Creole, or Wildfire. Does the software work for blow molding? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, no. We only <laughs> focus yeah. on conventional injection molding, injection compression, and purely compression molding mucil. And probably in the future we could do blow molding. But yeah, somebody I had asked about you. metal injection too, and that's still a no at this point. I just want to remind attendees that we do still have some time for questions, so if you want to type them into the question pane on the computer, John and Ken can continue to answer a few more. Yeah, here's one. Are we able to define meshes bigger or smaller, defined manually? Um, yeah, that, that slide bar that I had shown earlier had a accuracy setting of 1 to 5. The Like the 1 or the 2 was for fast calculation just to see a quick filling. Uh, that goes incredibly fast. Uh, if you go up to a 5, that's incredibly small. You're going to get many millions of elements. And uh, so for very thin wall, small, micro parts, uh, you can use the highest settings, but there is a very good range of accuracy uh, from big parts to small parts. Uh, it's all handled uh, right there in that range. Uh, somebody's trying to nail me down on a Symmetron 11 release date. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I believe that it's officially going to be released, I think, in April, but Symmetron here in North America likes to get it. we got to do uh, a little bit of uh, testing with it. we got to put our localization wrap around it so that uh, the drafting stuff is in ANC and not ISO. 
Uh, once we get the North American flavoring onto it, we'll start shipping out CDs. So even though I say April, uh, don't beat me up if you don't get a CD in April. Uh, it's going to be very soon. It's the best I can say. I see another materials question there. Ken, how many grades of materials are available in the database? 6,000. We have 6,000 in our R11 version. And uh, of course, we are still working with our material suppliers, so we are still adding more material into our data bank. Uh, somebody's asking if Symmetron can take scan data straight in and convert it to surfaces or solids. Uh, not really. Uh, we have a product called Reeng uh, that we do sell that handles that. Uh, but without the Reeng product, uh, Symmetron doesn't um, convert point cloud into surfaces. All right. I think at this point we uh, answer most of the questions, but I want people to know that they can contact Symmetron directly. I think, John, you can put the slide up that has yeah, Symmetron's yeah, yeah. contact information. Um, they can get in touch with you with anything specific that we have not answered. Uh, and again, this, this was recorded, so I think later today or maybe tomorrow, I think later today, this will be available, the recording for anybody who missed any part of it, to then listen in. Um, we appreciate your time in joining us, and I also like to thank the organizers for helping this presentation to run smoothly. This concludes our webinar. Again, this is Christina Fugis with Mulmaking Technology. Um, have a great day. Thank you, Christina. Bye, Bye, everybody. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.